Once again, we see that passage of Scripture in Psalm 11, verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I think we saw from our last lecture that certainly the biblical foundations of this nation are being eroded today. Does this mean, though, that the situation is hopeless? I don't think so. I think there are some things we can do to restore our constitutional republic and the biblical principles upon which that republic was founded. And so I'd like to close with a note of hope here and suggest some closing steps that we can take. First, I think it vitally important that we make sure that our own faith is based upon the solid rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his revealed word. And once again, we need to remember here what we talked about in that very first lecture, this distinction between law and gospel. While law exists to restrain the exercise of sin, law cannot take away sin. Only Jesus Christ on the cross can do that. And in taking away that desire to sin, changing our lives, only the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives as we know Jesus Christ can do that. Remember, too, that the basic building block of America is the family, and that the family is the basic structure through which the state and the church relate to the individual. And that being the case, it is an institution ordained of God. And so we need to make sure that our own families are on a firm foundation. I'm saying that we cannot simply force moral legislation down the nation's throat. Rather, we need to be working from the bottom up, starting with ourselves and our own families, in making sure that we're on a solid foundation, that our families are on a solid foundation, and then from there, work outward. Once again, it is this principle of government or control. People need government, but that government can take many forms. We can accept the government of God in our lives, or we are going to have to have government control from the state. Freedom can only exist when people voluntarily restrain themselves in the public interest. There can be no freedom without that kind of civic virtue. Either that comes from within, and if it does, it can only be the power of God that supplies it, or else the state is going to have to provide that discipline by government coercion. That's why John Adams said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Second thing is we need to build a base of citizens, citizens who understand constitutional principles of government and who will not elect anyone to public office who does not respect those principles. To be admitted as an undergraduate freshman at William and Mary College in the 1700s, you had to be able to read and write and converse and debate in Greek. That was an undergraduate entry requirement. When John Jay entered King's College, which is now Columbia University, he had to take the same entrance requirement that all incoming refreshmen took. And one of those requirements was that he translate the first 10 chapters of the Gospel of John from Greek into Latin. We had a high rate of literacy and a very high intellectual sophistication in those days. And that went over into an understanding of the Constitution as well. Alexi de Tocqueville, the French observer who visited America in the 1830s and wrote that classic work, Democracy in America, has this to say about America. First of all, he speaks of how Americans tend to be rather ignorant about what's going on in Europe. But then he says, but if you question the average American respecting his own country, the cloud that dimmed his intelligence will immediately disperse. His language will become as clear and precise as his thoughts. He will inform you what his rights are and by what means he exercises them. He will be able to point out customs which obtain in the political world. You will find that he is well acquainted with the rules of the administration and that he is familiar with the mechanism of the laws. A 1986 study that was released by the U.S. Bicentennial Commission 
revealed a great deal of ignorance among Americans today about our Constitution. For example, 46% of Americans, the study said, do not know that the purpose of the Constitution was to create a federal government and define its powers. 26% think its purpose was to declare independence from England. 59% do not know that the Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments. 27% think the Bill of Rights is the preamble to the Constitution. How do we create this cadre or body of citizens who understand these principles? I think the church needs to be involved in doing this. Much of the Bible has to do with law and government. Our colonial preachers used to preach election sermons at election time in which they would remind their people of their civic responsibilities and often comment on many of the issues of the day from a biblical standpoint. Those who say today, I don't preach about government, I don't preach about politics, I only preach the Bible, really need to say, I only preach part of the Bible. Because much of the Bible does talk about things like abortion, or crime and punishment, or war and military service, or gun control, or economics, our responsibility to the poor. Practically any issue we can imagine today is addressed, at least in principle, in Scripture. And if we are not going to address those issues, we are not preaching the whole counsel of God. This particular Institute on the Constitution, the video series and audio series will be available for churches and Sunday school classes to be shown in Bible studies and other groups. I'm available to present this seminar personally to church groups. If any of you have churches or church groups or citizens groups that would like it presented, but building this body of citizens who understand and abide by constitutional principles is absolutely essential. There's a most interesting account that I read recently about a man by the name of Horatio Bunce. This was a farmer who lived back in the 1830s, and he was not any kind of national figure, although he was respected in his community as a man who was well-read and well-informed on what was going on, and a man of good judgment and common sense. There was a congressman back in Tennessee at that time by the name of Davy Crockett. And all of this comes from a book published in 1884, The Life of Colonel David Crockett. And in addition to being a soldier and a frontiersman, Crockett served four terms in Congress. And Crockett speaks about an occasion in which he was traveling in a part of his district that he wasn't very familiar with. And he saw this farmer, who turned out to be Horatio Bunce, came up and introduced himself. And Horatio Bunce said, Yes, Colonel Crockett, I know who you are. I voted for you in the last election. I shall not do so again. And when Crockett asked why not, Horatio Bunce said, because you violated your oath of office to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Well, Davy Crockett was utterly astounded by that. What do you mean? How did I violate my oath of office? Horatio Bunce said, do you remember when you voted on that measure to provide disaster relief for those victims of a fire? Crockett said, well, yes, but I mean, what fair-minded citizen could possibly object to helping those poor people? Bunce said, that's not the issue. The issue is you took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. Now, the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, says that there are only three purposes for which you can tax and spend the money of the people of the United States. One is to pay debts, and this was not a debt. One is to provide the common defense, and this had nothing to do with defense. And the third is to promote the general welfare, and this was not general welfare. This was for the specific welfare of a small group. You violated your oath. I shall not vote for you again. Well, Davy Crockett said, you are absolutely right. He said, I'll tell you what, if you would call a meeting of farmers in this area, I will publicly acknowledge my error, apologize for it, and vow that I will never make that mistake again. Bunce agreed to do that. Crockett made that apology. A couple of years later, there was a measure in Congress to provide for a special pension for a widow. 
And it looked like it was certain to pass when Crockett stood up and said that we have no authority to appropriate one dollar of the taxpayer's money for this purpose. It is not a debt, and everyone on this floor knows it is not a debt. It is not for the common defense. It is not for the general welfare. He said, Mr. Speaker, I am the poorest man in this house, but I will give one week's pay to this widow, and if others here will do likewise, it will amount to more than this bill calls for. Well, the bill was promptly defeated, but when Crockett passed his coonskin cap, he found that nobody else contributed, and he later observed that even in that day, politicians were much more willing to spend the taxpayers' money than they were to spend their own. Just imagine what our country would be like today if we had a hundred million Horatio Bunces out there, citizens who understand the limits of our Constitution and refuse to vote for anybody who will violate those limits. Let's imagine we had several hundred people like Davy Crockett in Congress today who understand those limits and vote accordingly. The whole nature of America could be changed. Creating this base of citizens with this understanding is what this seminar is all about. And I hope you will take it as your personal mission as well to take the things that you've learned here and help spread this message, give this understanding to others in your community. A third thing that I think is needed here is to help judges and lawyers and law students understand these constitutional principles. Now, don't take the view that we have to have a government by experts, that just because they've been to law school and you haven't, therefore they understand the Constitution and you don't. Quite frankly, in the average law school today, you don't have a whole lot about the Constitution. I was at a seminar on constitutional law attended by several dozen constitutional law professors, people who were teaching constitutional law at leading universities throughout the nation several years ago. And one of the speakers at this conference asked us, how many of you in teaching constitutional law require your students to read the Constitution? Less than a third of us raised our hands. And if you look at the average constitutional law textbook today, you will find it's dealing with many, many cases. It's a case law book that uses this case law method. There will be a lot in there about the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment due process clauses that we've spoken of. There will be some things in there about the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. You'll have a lot of discussion of the First Amendment. Then you will discuss some things about the Commerce Clause of Article I, Section 8, and the Taxing and Spending Clause. And most of the rest of the 99.5% of the Constitution is utterly ignored. Don't think that just because somebody is a lawyer that he has a better understanding of the Constitution than you. Chances are he didn't get it in law school and hasn't looked at it since. I have no embarrassment at all in acknowledging that I've learned a lot about the Constitution from people who are not lawyers. And I'm sure I'll learn a lot more. So don't be intimidated just by somebody who is a lawyer. What can we do to affect the law profession? Well, first of all, I urge support for Christian law schools. I mentioned our own, the Thomas Good Jones School of Law of Faulkner University in Montgomery. I can mention also the Regent School of Law there in Virginia Beach, Simon Greenleaf School of Law in California, or the Campbell School of Law in Buies Creek, North Carolina all schools of law that, to greater or lesser degrees, try to present a Christian understanding of law. In our statement of purpose and philosophy, in our catalog for the Jones School of Law, we say, the law school is dedicated to the fundamental concepts that the rule of law is the foundation of the nation and that biblical truth is the foundation of just law. I urge support for Christian and or conservative law student organizations, groups like the Christian Legal Society, like the Rutherford Institute and the Federalist Society. Materials such as what we've had here could have been very helpful to me when I was in law school. You might like to get a set of this institution to the, a law student that you might know. We need to support Christian lawyers, organizations who defend the rights of Christians, like the American Family Association, the National Legal Foundation, the Rutherford Institute, the 
Christian Law Association, the Christian Legal Society, the American Center for Law and Justice, Concerned Women for America, Legal Foundation, and others. Other groups, which, while not being groups of lawyers, work to promote an understanding of our constitutional heritage. The Plymouth Rock Foundation certainly has done a tremendous job in the things that they published and done in this regard. Likewise, Eagle Forum and American Vision and the Mayflower Institute and the Foundation for American Christian Education, Wall Builders, the Pilgrim Institute and others. And I know I have omitted organizations here that deserve mention, but those are some of the ones I'm most familiar with. If you're still looking for a career, or if you're looking for a change in careers, consider the possibility of law. It is an opportunity to make an impact for the things you believe. A fourth thing that I would argue here is take a firm stand for the jurisprudence of original intent, that is, interpreting the Constitution as written. Now let's get an understanding of a few different terms here. When we speak about original intent, we mean that the Constitution should be interpreted according to a fixed standard, what the founders meant by it, versus this living Constitution idea that the meaning of the Constitution changes with time. Now we have other terms here. I've spoken of strict construction, that is, give the Constitution a narrow or literal meaning in contrast to loose construction, give it a broader meaning. Judicial restraint, meaning that the courts should take a more passive role and policy making should be left to the legislature. Judges shouldn't be making decisions about abortion and things like that. The legislatures ought to be doing those things versus judicial activism. The idea that judges should actively strike down statutes and policies that violate the judge's notions of what the law ought to be. Now, many times we use these terms of original intent and strict construction and judicial restraint as though they go hand in hand, and most of the time, especially today, they do. But not always. Sometimes the framers may not have intended that things be interpreted strictly. For example, we could ask the question when we read that Congress shall have the power to raise and support armies and to fight, maintain a navy. Well, does that mean the Air Force is unconstitutional? No, I don't think so. I think when they use the term armies, using it in the plural, that they meant a generic term for non-naval forces in general. And so sometimes the founders did not intend an overly narrow interpretation. Back in the 1930s, we had a conservative Supreme Court that engaged in judicial activism, striking down repeatedly New Deal acts passed by Congress and signed by President Roosevelt because the conservative court thought these violated the Commerce Clause and the Taxing and Spending Clause. There was a case of judicial conservatism and strict construction being used in a very judicially activist way. Whether it was consistent with original intent, people would disagree. My view is that it was. My point, though, is that original intent and strict construction and judicial restraint usually go hand in hand, but not always. Now let's look at some of the reasons why we should argue for original intent. First, we apply that principle in virtually every other area of law. If we want to interpret a statute, we look to what the legislators intended by it. If we have a question as to what a contract means, we look to the intent of those who made it. If we want to know the interpretation of a will, we look to the intent of the testator, the person who wrote the will. Why not apply the same principle to the Constitution? Now, the framers clearly assumed that original intent would be the guiding star in constitutional interpretation. The statements we cited earlier demonstrate that. Millions of Americans swear to uphold the Constitution when they enter the armed forces or other public office. I think the Constitution, certainly being the supreme law of the land, is entitled not to less deference than statutes, but rather more deference, more respect. Now, original intent does not preclude flexibility in application. You can apply it in principle. For example, there was a case some years ago involving whether or not wiretapping somebody's telephone line constituted an illegal search and seizure. If somebody had been on the floor of Congress with James Madison in 1789 and said, now, Mr. Madison, when you speak about unreasonable search and seizure, do you mean to include tapping people's telephone lines? Madison said, what? 
But to apply original intent in that situation, you would look at Madison's basic values, his basic mindset, put him in a situation with that technology, and how would he have responded in that circumstance? You can apply some flexibility there. Also, there's another basis for flexibility. If change in the Constitution is needed, we have an amendment process through Article 5. Use that rather than stretching the Constitution beyond recognition. I note, eighth, that even those who reject the idea of original intent nevertheless quote the framers when it suits their purposes. Notice how the liberal justices in the court will repeatedly quote out of context Thomas Jefferson's wall of separation between church and state. And finally, I would say that eliminating original intent leads to many dangers. When Justice Blackmun, for example, in Roe versus Wade, says that abortion laws all across the nation are unconstitutional, he says they are unconstitutional because they violate the constitutional right to abortion. Well, it's fair to ask, Justice Blackmun, where do you find the right to abortion in the Constitution? And Justice Blackmun's opinion, which is a lengthy one, basically says, I don't know where it is, but it's got to be in there somewhere. And if you think I'm being unfair, I can only urge you read Roe versus Wade. That's essentially what he says. He says, oh, there might be sort of a hint of it in the Third Amendment about not quartering troops, kind of a privacy idea there, maybe in the Fourth Amendment about search and seizure, or maybe self-incrimination. He says, maybe it's the Ninth Amendment, these other rights. Or maybe it's the liberty idea of the, yeah, that's probably the best, the liberty idea of the 14th Amendment, you know, that liberty includes maybe privacy, and privacy includes maybe making decisions about yourself, and that includes maybe deciding whether to have a child, and maybe that ought to be retroactive for abortion. But then he says, really, it's found in what he calls the penumbra of the Constitution. Now, when he uses that word penumbra, he uses a word that most of us wouldn't look up, it's a word meaning shadow or aura. In other words, he's saying there's a shadow around the Bill of Rights or an aura around it. And he seems to be saying that he has been issued some special set of colored glasses. He also refers to it as emanations. And through those glasses, he can see those emanations. And he sees things written in the margins or between the lines, like abortion and gay rights and things like that. The others, like Justice Scalia, apparently they didn't get the same glasses, so they just don't see. Well, when you start talking about a constitution with penumbras and emanations and things like that, we're not talking about judicial restraint or activism. We're not talking about strict construction or loose construction. We're talking about a new age constitution that can mean anything anybody wants it to mean, and we have removed the constitution from any kind of objective scholarship. In order to get back to any kind of sound and enduring principles, we need to return to the jurisprudence of original intent. How do we do that? Well, for one thing, we need to work for the election or appointment of judges at all levels who understand and believe in original intent and strict construction and judicial restraint. We need a systematic method for evaluating judges. You know, it's easy to send out a questionnaire listing the legislators and how they all voted on certain key issues. But that's harder with judges because the judges don't all vote on the same issues. Each judge has his own caseload. If one judge found 70% of defendants guilty and another found 60% of them innocent, it may just be that one had more innocent defendants. And so we need a systematic method by which voters can know which judges have sound principles and which ones don't. And there's a challenge if somebody would like to take it up. We need to work for the election of a president who recognizes his proper role in the constitutional system and who will appoint judges and justices who hold sound constitutional principles. And we need to work to elect a Congress that will bring us back to sound constitutional principles, beginning with our own representatives. If their thinking and voting is unsound, don't vote to reelect them. We need to resist the growth of administrative law, these unelected administrative agencies, which are really only semi-responsible even to the president, which make their own regulations, even have their own courts, the imposed civil fines, the OSHA courts, the Social Security courts, the tax courts, and the like. We need to bring these under the judicial branch, not under the executive branch, because developing these administrative law courts is, in my opinion, a violation of the whole concept of separation of powers. I was once asked if I could teach administrative law. 
I said I'd be glad to. The course would be over in five minutes. I'd walk in, I'd slam the textbook down on the table, and I would say, everything in this book is unconstitutional, class dismissed, semester dismissed. We need to cut down the size of government, even if our own pet programs are affected. I think we need to support some federal efforts to eliminate the court's jurisdiction, the Supreme Court's jurisdiction over matters of abortion and flag burning. We already saw how that power exists in Article 3, Section 2. One of the most ingenious things that I've seen in recent years are the Tenth Amendment resolutions. These resolutions being passed in state legislatures, which in effect say that unless the federal government can show constitutional authority for any mandate they give us, we will not consider ourselves bound by that mandate. Now, some states that have passed these may get themselves into lawsuits. And if it's the federal judiciary and the whole federal government versus one or two states, the states may have to capitulate. But if 30 or 40 states pass resolutions like this, I think Congress would have to take notice. And I see that as a very viable possibility because this is an issue on which state legislators are our natural allies, liberal or conservative. They don't like the federal government telling them what to do and also telling them they have to do something and not giving them the funds to do it. There are certain other constitutional amendments that I think deserve consideration. One calling for more specific procedures in the event a constitutional convention is called could be helpful. One declaring that the Constitution shall be interpreted strictly according to the framers' intent. The only problem is that amendment will also be interpreted by the same judges, but it might change some things and it can't hurt. An amendment providing that the power granted to Congress in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 to tax for the general welfare shall not include the power to tax for the specific welfare of individuals or groups. Really, that's what it should mean to begin with, but sometimes an amendment to correct a misinterpretation might be appropriate. An amendment providing that the power granted to Congress in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 to regulate interstate commerce shall not include the power to regulate intrastate commerce or production. An amendment to protect the right to life for unborn children. I urge you to speak out, to make your views known to your friends, your community, and your elected representatives, to get involved, to work with organizations like the Plymouth Rock Foundation and others, which share your position on these issues, to work with the political party of your choice, to elect candidates and adopt platform principles reflecting sound constitutional principles. And don't let your constitutional rights atrophy for lack of use. I see in the Book of Acts four occasions where Paul exercises his rights as either a Roman citizen or a Jewish citizen. When he's beaten, for example, and once they discover that as a Roman citizen, they could be in some serious trouble for having beaten him, and so they want to give him the red carpet treatment and let him go, and he says, nothing doing. I have a right to be heard. He uses this each time, stands on his rights, and he does so not because, oh boy, here's my big malpractice suit, I'm going to get big bucks on this one and I can buy that villa off, off Crete now and retire. No, he does so to gain a hearing for the gospel. Don't let your constitutional rights atrophy for lack of use. Exercise them, and that has to mean be willing to defend them in court if necessary. And finally, pray for our constitutional republic and for freedom-loving people everywhere. Thank you, and may God bless you.